But would you turn with me, please, to the passage that we read in Acts 24. Acts chapter 24. And reading verse 25. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. For a few moments this morning, I want us to focus on this uh, encounter that Paul had with this man, Felix. Really this uh, trial episode in the life of Paul. And we're going to look at this uh, uh, passage, these verses, under three headings. Because there's really three principal characters uh, at work in these verses. We're going to look at the denunciation of Tertullus. Then we're going to look at the defence of Paul. And finally, we're going to look at the delay of Felix. Denunciation, defence, delay. First then we have the denunciation of Tertullus. That's in verses 1 down to 9, where Luke focuses on the attack on Paul by this man Tertullus. The attack on Paul by this man Tertullus. Now let's just consider the context of these particular verses. In Acts chapter 21, verse 27 to 36, we find Paul being arrested in the temple in Jerusalem. In Acts 21, verse 37 to verse chapter 22 and verse 21, we find Paul addressing the crowd following his arrest. In Acts 22, verse 22 to verse 29, we find Paul being examined by the Romans. In Acts 22, verse 30 to chapter 23, verse 11, we find Paul appearing before the Jewish council. And then in Acts 23, verse 12 to verse 35, we find Paul being taken uh, to Caesarea by the Romans. And he is going to appear before the Roman governor in Caesarea. And it's now that we come to the initiation of the trial proceedings in verse 1 of chapter 24. We read, and after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. Luke tells us when this took place. It was after five days. Luke tells us where this took place. He has told us in chapter 23 that Paul had been taken down to Caesarea, that is 60 miles from Jerusalem. And now we're told that the others come down to Caesarea. They also come. Luke tells us who came down. We have Ananias, the high priest. We have the Jewish elders. And we have this man, Tertullus, a, a highly skilled legal professional, a lawyer, a man who has an ability with words. And finally, Luke tells us what happened. Ananias and the chief elders and Tertullus lay their case before the Roman governor, the Roman procurator, this man named Felix. And after bringing their case to the Roman governor, eh, Paul is summoned to appear before them. This brings us then to the prosecution in verses 2 down to 9. And we can begin by considering Tertullus's opening statement. Look at verses 2 down to 4. At that time, lawyers often try to ingratiate themselves with the particular presiding judge, normally on this occasion, the Roman governor. And Tertullus is no exception. He is a smooth operator. He is a suave operator. He refers to Felix as most excellent Felix. He speaks about the peace that Felix had secured. He speaks about the reforms that Felix had introduced. He speaks about uh, the gratitude that the Jews have for Felix everywhere and in every way. Now, these opening remarks are high on flattery, but low on honesty. The historians tell us that there was constant unrest during Felix's tenure. The historians tell us that Felix was eventually recalled to Rome because of his oppressive regime. The historians tell us nothing noble or notable about Felix's reforms. Quite simply, Felix was one of the most corrupt and one of the most incompetent of Roman governors. And we can continue by hearing the charges that Tertullus goes on to bring against Paul. He accuses Paul of being a troublemaker. He is a plague, a pestilence, a contagious disease. He is a catalyst for chaos. He's one, Tertullus says, who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world. He's a troublemaker. He accuses Paul of being the ringleader of a religious sect. The Jews often refer to the Christians as followers of the Nazarene. 
And now Tertullus is claiming that Paul is the ringleader. He is the chief of this group who had pledged their unfailing loyalty, their unfailing devotion to this man from Nazareth, crucified by Rome, Jesus Christ. Furthermore, he calls, he calls it a sect. He says that this group that Paul is operating within isn't operating within the bounds of Orthodox Judaism. Instead, it's a religious movement that doesn't have the backing of Rome. Finally, Tertullus accuses Paul of trying to profane the temple. Now, the temple was at the centre of the nation's political life, at the centre of the nation's spiritual life. And Tertullus claims that Paul had tried to desecrate it, he had tried to profane it, he had tried to make it unclean and unusable. And so they were left with no option, he says in verse 6, but to seize Paul. The reality is that they had tried to lynch Paul until the Romans had intervened. And Tertullus brings things to a conclusion in verses 8 and 9. He calls on Felix to examine Paul for himself and the rest of the Jews join in the charge, adding their vicious and vindictive voices to what Tertullus has just said. Now, friends, as we hear Paul being denounced in this way, we're seeing a very familiar biblical theme, a very familiar biblical pattern, the theme of the persecution of the righteous. It's something that we find in the Old Testament. We have Joseph who is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and is thrown into prison. We have David who is falsely accused by Saul and is flees into exile. We have Daniel who is falsely accused by the king's advisors and is cast into the lion's den. We also find this in the New Testament. We can remember what Jesus said. He said, you will be persecuted but for righteousness sake. He, he told his followers that if the world hated him, it would hate them as well. And we can remember not only what Jesus said, but what happened to Jesus. Because like Paul, Jesus is arrested. And like Paul, Jesus is falsely accused to a Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And we're told that following his arrest and following the false accusations, Jesus is condemned to death and he is nailed to a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem where he dies. The Lord's people are those who face opposition. And they face opposition from those who hate the word of the living God. They face opposition from those who hate the truth of the living God. They face opposition from those who hate the gospel. Of the living God. And so, friends, as we consider these verses today, there are warning to every Christian that dark days lie ahead. That if you are a Christian, you are not to expect the approval and the applause and the acclaim of the world. These verses are warning you look at what happened to Paul, look at what happened to Jesus, look at what happened to Joseph, look at what happened to Daniel, look at what happened to David. And if that is how the world treated these men, it will treat the Lord's people in the same way. But these verses are also an encouragement to every Christian who might be going through these dark days. They're reminding every Christian who is going through these dark days that these deadly and demonic enemies are to be expected. They're to be expected. It's not that you've done something wrong. It's not that you've missed out something. This is to be expected. This is the way that the Lord and his people are treated. So we have here first the denunciation of Tertullus. We have second the defence of Paul. You see that in verses 10 down to 21. And here Luke focuses on Paul's answer to Tertullus' attack. Paul's answer to Tertullus' attack. Paul begins to answer the charges that Tertullus had brought against him in verses 10 to 18. Paul begins by addressing the governor. Now, Tertullus, you remember, had addressed Felix with these very flattering words, but very dishonest words. Paul is respectful, but he's restrained. He acknowledges that Felix is a man who had great experience in trying legal cases, and he acknowledges his cheerfulness in being able to bring his defense to Felix. And Paul then argues that he is not a troublemaker. Look at verses 11 to 13. He admits that he came up to Jerusalem 12 days ago. 
However, however, he had gone up to Jerusalem and up to the temple to worship. He was a pious pilgrim. He hadn't disputed with anyone, and no one can prove the charge that he is a troublemaker, that he is a plague, that he is a pestilence. Paul carries on by claiming that he is not the ringleader of a religious sect. Look at verses 14 to 16. Now again, he admits something. He admits that he's a follower of the way. Now, the way is how the early Christian movement are described throughout the book of Acts. They are not called Christians, Christ followers. They are called followers of the way. It is built on Jesus' great self-declaration. You remember what he said when he said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way to God. He is the way to salvation. And the way has been opened through his death and through his resurrection. But Paul claims here to be a follower of the way who worships the God of our fathers. Furthermore, he claims to be a follower of the way who believes what is written in the law and the prophets. His accusers were saying that he was one who had abandoned the Old Testament faith, that he was branching out and doing his own thing. And, and Paul is saying here, no, 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 no. As far as Paul is concerned, Jesus is the true prophet. He is the true priest. He is the true king. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament faith. And therefore, everything written in the Old Testament, everything written in the prophets, everything written in the law was precious to Paul because it pointed to Jesus. And Paul's thinking, Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. You cannot have Jesus without the Old Testament. Paul goes further. As he claims to be a follower of the way who has this resurrection hope. Now, this is really the master stroke on Paul's part, because the Jews were split on the issue of the resurrection of the dead. You had the conservative Pharisees who believed in a future resurrection, and you had the liberal Sadducees who denied a future resurrection. And so here we have Paul, and he is affirming his belief his hope in a future resurrection day. And as he does this, he's saying, I am a conservative Jew. He's saying, I am operating with an orthodox Judaism. I, I am not going my own way. I'm not creating a sect. And he claims to be a follower of the way who attempts to have a clear conscience before God and before man. Finally, Paul argues that he didn't desecrate the temple. You see that in verses 17 to 18. He says, well, yes, I, I did come up to the temple, but I came with arms for my nation, my Jewish nation, and I came with offerings to present in the temple. And when he was found in the temple, he says that he was found in a purified condition. He was found in a ceremonially clean condition. He wasn't coming with a tumult. He wasn't coming with a crowd. So his accusers have said, Paul is a troublemaker. Paul says, no, I'm not. His accusers say, uh, he's the leader of a religious sect. Paul says, no, I'm not. His accusers say, he's trying to desecrate the temple. Paul says, no, I'm not. And this brings us to the conclusion that Paul reaches in verses 18 to 21. Paul states in verses 18 that the Asian Jews should be present and bringing their accusation. They're the ones who had the original problem with what Paul was doing. They're the ones who had stirred up all this trouble for Paul, but, but where are they? They're not present. They're not standing before Felix. They're not speaking along with Tertullus. They're absent. But Paul impresses the Jews who are present to clearly and categorically state what he's done wrong. They'd accuse him of being a troublemaker. They'd accuse him of being the ringleader of a religious sect. They'd accuse him of trying to desecrate the temple. And Paul has answered each of these charges. And he's saying, what more are you going to say against me? What guilt do you have to bring against me? And Paul closes in verse 21 by saying that the only thing, this is amazing, the only thing that he is guilty of is regarding the resurrection of the dead. And it's because Paul believes in a future resurrection, which the crucified and risen Christ will preside over, that he is on trial. Paul is now steering the trial in the direction he wants it to go in. Paul has this great desire to see Felix and his accusers come face to face with the reality of the resurrection of Christ. 
and the future resurrection that all the followers of Christ can anticipate. And so he closes his defense by saying, it is with respect to my hope in the resurrection of the dead that I stand trial. I don't care what you think about me, but I want you to be clear on this, that I am focused, I am fixated, I am all out when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. Well, friends, as we listen to Paul's defense here, we can see that he is a man who is passionate about the resurrection. The resurrection of this crucified Jesus is central in Paul's thinking and theology. He's able to write in Romans 6, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. He's able to write in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Go through Paul's letters and you see the resurrection of Jesus is central. And because Jesus is risen, as far as Paul is concerned, his people will also rise. He's able to write in 1 Corinthians 15, If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And again, he's able to write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. As far as Paul is concerned, Jesus is raised and his people will be raised with him, in him, through him, by him. And now as Paul stands on trial with his life hanging in the balance, he uses it as a God-given opportunity to speak about the resurrection. Now, friends, as we consider these verses today, they're a reminder that we ought to be unashamed in believing in the resurrection of Christ and our future resurrection through him. And they're an encouragement to us to be unashamed in proclaiming this message and not only proclaiming this message, but defending this message that comes under attack, that is mocked, that is belittled so often. I've told you before that in a place where I previously ministered, there were members of the clergy in another denomination who quite, quite proudly said they did not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. We are to be those who are unashamed in believing in the resurrection of Christ and defending the resurrection of Christ and proclaiming the resurrection of Christ as Paul faces the prospect of death for his faith. He uses the trial where he is standing on trial for his life to lift up the fact that Jesus is risen and we, friends, we are to be the, sh the same. Why on earth are we ashamed about testifying to the resurrection in our schools? Why are we ashamed about testifying to the resurrection of Jesus in our workplaces, in our homes, wherever we might find ourselves? Paul wasn't ashamed when he stood on trial for his life, his defense. This brings us third and finally to the delay of Felix. Look at verses 22, 27. Here Luke focuses on Felix's ambivalent attitude to what Paul is saying. Felix has heard both sides of the debate and you see in verses 22 and 23 that he now places Paul in custody. Luke tells us about the decision that Felix reached. We're told that Felix had a rather accurate knowledge of the way. We're also told that Felix put them off 
And we're told that Felix told him to wait until Claudius Lysias, the Roman tribune in Jerusalem, arrived and gave his version of events because Claudius Lysias was the one who had first examined Paul. He's the one who had arrested Paul. He's the one who had seen the reaction of the crowds to Paul. And it's at this point that Felix puts Paul in protective custody. Felix gives the order that Paul be kept in custody in Caesarea until Claudius Lysias comes, but he allows Paul to have a measure of liberty and that he be allowed to see his friends and that they be allowed to attend his needs. Following this, Luke tells us about the conversation that Felix had with Paul. Look at verses 24 to 27. Felix and his wife Drusilla summon Paul to appear before them in verse 24. Now, Felix and Drusilla are interesting characters. Felix is this experienced Roman governor. He's obviously an older man, a man who probably had experience in uh, Rome's wars and Rome's campaigns, and he had been married three times. Drusilla is a Jewish woman. She is barely 20 years old, and she has left her first husband to go off with Felix. Their lives were front page news. Their lives were a scandal. And they now hear Paul speak to them about faith in Christ Jesus. Paul's great resolution in life was to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Paul's great boast in life was Christ and his cross. And that is what he speaks to Felix and Drusilla about now. He speaks to them about Christ Jesus and about the importance of faith. You see the word faith in Christ Jesus. And Luke tells us what they specifically heard from Paul concerning Christ Jesus. Look at verse 25. He spoke to them about righteousness. That is, he told them about the righteousness of God. He told them about the fact that it's important to be righteous before this God. He told them that no one is righteous before God. And he told them about the righteousness that can be found in Christ and Christ alone. He's saying, you, you want to stand before God. You need Christ. You need to be focused on Christ. You need faith in Christ. And then you can stand before God. And he spoke to them about self-control. Mastery over one's pleasures, mastery over one's passions. What a message for this couple whose lives had been dominated by unbridled lust. And he spoke to them about the judgment to come. Paul's not concerned about standing on trial before Felix. No, Paul is concerned about Felix standing on trial before this righteous God and having to give an account of his unrighteous life to this righteous God. And look at how Felix reacts, verse 26. He's alarmed by all this talk about righteousness and self-control and judgment. And so he tells Paul to go away. He, he, he doesn't want to hear any more. At the same time, he's hopeful that Paul will attempt to bribe him. Do you see what a conflicted man he is? What an indecisive man he is. He's a man, we're told, who liked to hear Paul preach. But when it got too much, when it got too real, when it got too direct, he would send Paul away. He would say, enough, I don't want to hear any more. He's a man who heard wonderful sermons about righteousness, about self-control, about the judgment. And at the same time, he would attempt to bribe the preacher. In his commentary, John Stott writes, I think Felix knew that Paul had something more precious than money, something which money cannot buy. But unfortunately, there is no evidence that Felix ever capitulated to Christ and was redeemed. And the narrative concludes with Felix being replaced by Porcius Festus. But he leaves Paul in custody, in prison, in order to curry favour with the Jewish leadership who would have to give a reference to the emperor about him. Verse 27. That's all Felix cares about, how he stands before the Jews, how he stands before the emperor rather than how he stands before this righteous God. Well, friends, as we witness Felix's delay tactics, we can see that he's a man who procrastinated, a man who put things off when it came to dealing with Jesus and dealing with the claims of the gospel. What we see in these verses is the urgency of Paul and the sheer lethargy of Felix 
Paul is summoned before Felix and he speaks to him about Jesus and he speaks to him about righteousness and he speaks to him about self-control and he speaks to him about the judgment to come. Paul is focused. He is direct. He is to the point. He is blunt. He gets his message across and Felix heard all that Paul was saying and he said, let's leave it for another day. Let's leave it for another day. He's been given this incredible opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel, and he puts it off. He fails to see how urgent it is to make peace with God through Christ and be found righteous before this righteous God in the righteousness of Christ. And before he knew it, he had just sunk deeper and deeper into this mighty pit of sin. And you know, friends, there's really a word for every one of us who's listening today. There's a word for you if you're not a Christian. The message from these verses is seize the day. Seize the day. Last year, I told some of you the story about three demons. The devil was summoning his evil forces to consider how best to keep the world on his side. And one demon said, send me. And I will tell them there is no God. And the devil replied, they will never believe you. Most of them know deep down that there is a God. The second demon said, send me and I will tell them that there is no heaven or hell. And Satan shook his head and said, that will never do. They know that there is life after death. They want their ministers to package them off to heaven, even if they gave heaven no thought in life. Then the third demon spoke and said, send me. And I'll tell them that there is a God. And I'll tell them there is a heaven. And I'll tell them there is a hell. I'll tell them all about Jesus. And I'll tell them all about the resurrection even. But I'll also tell them that there is no hurry to decide. I will tell them that there is always time. Excellent, said the devil with satisfaction. People will be fooled into believing that there is plenty of time to change and hell will overflow with lost souls. And every day people go to a lost eternity because they procrastinate and they put off dealing with Jesus. And in the light of this, I want to remind you that time is short. The days are brief. Your life is a breath. There is a step between you and death. And you have been given today this wonderful opportunity, this incredible opportunity to deal directly with Jesus, to get on your knees and to cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I will not let you go until you bless me. Friend, if it is not convenient for you to do so now, if it is not convenient for you to deal with Jesus today, when do you think it will be? When do you think it will be? And I really want to speak to the young people in our congregation, so please listen to me, young people. If it is not convenient for you to put your trust in Jesus today, at the age of 10, at the age of 15, at the age of 20, when do you think it will be? When you're 30? When you're 50? When you're 70? When you're 90? None of us are guaranteed to see these days. I want to encourage you young people, as I want to encourage everyone in our congregation to seize the day and to call on the Lord while he is near, and when he can be found, seize the day. But there is also a word for you if you are a Christian. Again, the message from these verses as we look at Paul is, seize the day. So many people are lost because they put off dealing with Jesus, but you know, many others are lost because Christians put off telling them about Jesus. My dear friend, if it is not convenient for you to tell your loved one about Jesus today, 
When do you think it will be? If it is not convenient for you to tell your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parent, your child, your brother, your sister, your work colleague, your friend about Jesus today, when do you think it's going to be convenient? Because in all likelihood, you were probably saying this time last year, I will tell them someday, but you perhaps haven't done so. And you say, well, I'll wait till a convenient opportunity arises. And my dear friend, that opportunity may never arise. Let me be very clear. And I'm saying this to myself more than to anyone else, because you know, I say it often, I am an appalling evangelist. I look at my friends in the ministry and I think if only I were more like them. I look at some of those of you in the congregation, I think if only I were more like them. So I am speaking to myself as much as and more than I'm speaking to anyone else here. Friends, our loved ones, the people who are precious to us, may thank us today for not telling them about Jesus. They may thank us today for not speaking to them about the gospel. They may thank us today for not being overly zealous and overly focused on getting the gospel across to them. But friend, they will curse us from the caverns of hell for all eternity for failing to do so. That's what I need to hear. What use is it if people say, thank you for not being too preachy, preachy with me, if they're going to be cursing my name from the pit of hell in the next life? As we consider then these verses, they are urging us to be urgent in dealing with Jesus. They are urging us to be urgent in coming to Jesus. They are urging us to be urgent in closing in with Jesus. And they are urging us to be urgent and telling our friends, telling our families, telling our loved ones about this Jesus. Let's not be like that procrastinating proconsul, that procrastinating procurator, that miserable man, Felix, who said, let's leave it for another day. Amen. And may the Lord bless these thoughts to us. We'll close by singing the words of the hymn, There is Power in the Blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you glory the love that win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Oh, the love. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Thank you.
Jesus, your King, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Won't you let daily His praises to sing, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. 